Good morning, Redwood family. Hey, a little disclaimer today. Today's teaching is rated PG-13. So um, if uh, you have uh, younger kids in here and you want to take them to children's ministry, uh, you, you're, you're free to do that. Um, but uh, also as a reminder, we, wanna, we, we know kids are hearing about this early and earlier, right? And we want to proactively set the narrative instead of just always react. I, I know they're going to hear it from their friends and from Netflix and from Google. So I want them to hear from it from you first and from me and from the Word of God. Amen. So super important for that, but just want to give that disclaimer. And this is in large part uh, the Bible's fault, so don't blame me. Uh, second thing here, um, how many of you wish we were outside right now? Okay, a lot of us. Okay, next week, if the weather's the same, uh, we're going to be outside. There's a lot of moving parts. It's a lot harder than it, than it looks. Um, and maybe some, I saw some of you bring your chairs, so I, I'm sorry. Uh, but we were worried about the 9 a.m. Uh, cold morning. But next week, if there's no smoke, pray, you know, pray to the Lord. Uh, we will uh, do our best to be outside. So that's the plan, okay? Sound good? Because, you know, it looks like we might be a little bit out of compliance, a little bit over 100 here. So, you know, this is our peaceful protest. And uh, we're protesting the cultural uh, sexual ethic. So that's what we're doing this morning. And let me pray for us. Father, uh, we're in such need of your wisdom and guidance this morning. Uh, Lord, we, we recognize we, there's, there's just so many, um, there's so much false instruction in our lives, so many things we hear that aren't true, Lord. So would you clarify and open our minds and hearts for what you have for us this morning? Amen. Well, my dad and I got to the game earlier than everyone else. We're in Klamath Falls. It's a chilly morning for a soccer tournament. And because we're early, my dad pulls out his Bible. Classic pastor dad move, right? But it's cool. I mean, I like the Bible. And, you know, um, like I said, I'm probably 11 years old. And I know it's the fifth of the month. Why do I remember that? Because we read the proverb of the day, Proverbs 5. But things soon get real awkward. See, Proverbs 5 is one of the more sexualized texts in the entire Bible. And so what started as a Bible study turns into a sex talk. And like Michael Scott from The Office, I'm in my head shouting, no, no, gosh, no. I was never more relieved to see another teammate pull up and to get out in the chilly air so I could leave the car. And my dad was probably relieved as well. And in our series through Proverbs, we've seen this father-like character instruct his son on life and teach him things. My dad taught me how to change a tire, how to drive, how to talk to my mom, how to preach, and even a little bit uh, sparingly, he taught me about uh, sex. And, you know, this father in, in Proverbs does the same thing. He instructs a lot. And he has a lot to say. Unlike my dad, he has a lot to say about sex. I'd say if there's any one theme that he hits the most, it's this theme. Large parts, if not the entire part of Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 is dedicated to this theme. And of course, it's always awkward if you've given the talk or gotten the talk. It's awkward for me right now. But I don't get the feeling that this father in Proverbs is feeling that awkward. He is so passionate about this topic. He loves his son so much that he's just going to lay it out there. Son, you got to hear this. Not long after my awkward talk with my dad, I had my first experience with pornography on dial-up internet. And, you know, I'm 11 years old. I follow a sports page to a cheerleading page to a pornography page. I'm there for about a minute or two and then shut it down. And I feel so gross and contaminated and guilty. Later that night, I confessed to my dad what I had done, and I'm not even sure why. It's not like we really talked about these things that much, but I did. And I'm confident that the conversation we had that night, bringing it to light so early, prevented pornography from ever having a serious grip on my life. I'm so thankful for that. See, the Father's instruction is so important. And the reason it's so important is because there's so much foolish instruction. And when I say Father's instruction from the Proverbs, that's not just from our dads, although that's super important. It's any kind of wise uh, counsel. My parents spoke into my life in some powerful ways, but there are probably 50 others who loved me and taught me and continue to teach me 
Uh, many of you in this room are that in my life. So today we're going to look at two foolish views in contrast with the father's view. You might have played that game, two truths and a lie. We're playing two lies and a truth. Two lies and a truth. So one, sex isn't that big of a deal. Two, sex is the most important thing in life. And three, sex is an exclusive gift. So lie number one, sex is not that big of a deal. We might call this the undervaluing of sex. Proverbs 30, verse 18. There are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a young woman. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. So in the poem, the first three pictures are images of something penetrating another realm. In the fourth picture, sexual intimacy is compared to these wonderful things. It's like a ship going through the sea. It's like an eagle soaring through the sky. And then verse 20 hits us like a stack of bricks. It's the contrast is powerful. Uh, verse 20, this is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. So here, sex is no longer compared to flying or sailing, but to sloppy eating. It's a gross image. Imagine eating with someone at a fancy restaurant. You order your food and it arrives. And then 30 seconds later, their food's gone because they just ate it super fast. It's all over their fingers and their hands. And, and, and then they burp and get up and leave without saying bye. The meal is cheapened. And sex can be treated with the same kind of casual, careless consumer mindset. In the ancient world, sex was routinely done at parties with prostitutes, with slaves and servants. You might sleep with your spouse for pleasure, but you'd go, or for, for babies, but you'd go elsewhere for pleasure. I mean, boys, girls, servants, they really had no say in the matter. If you were a social superior, you got what you want when you wanted it. Although the, the inferiors could use sex to move forward in society. And then there's the temples. I read somewhere that the temple of Artemis at Ephesus once employed a thousand temple prostitutes. And so you would go to the temple, you'd pay an offering, you'd uh, offer a prayer for your pregnant wife or for your crops, sleep with the prostitute, and then you're done. You're off to your next errand at Home Depot. It was just another uh, transactional thing on the checklist. Now we might scoff at temple prostitution today, hopefully, but our modern culture tends to undervalue sex as well. See, if we believe humans are just highly evolved animals, then why not operate like them? When I'm hungry, I eat. When I'm aroused, I find sex. Sex is simply seen as a biological function, just an appetite to appease. I've done nothing wrong. We see things like the hookup culture, where sex is seen simply as recreation. Just some Friday night fun, nothing special. Social media apps facilitate this kind of no-strings-attached sexual encounter with strangers. It does seem like this trend is going down. People are finding it extremely unsatisfying, lonely, and empty, as we all can imagine. But before we celebrate too much that that trend's going down, in large part, it's because pornography is going up. And that's a great example of the commodification of sex. It's like food. You see, real humans, we're complicated. We take work. And, but, but pornography has the appeal of simplicity and speed and ease just with the tap of our fingers. It's like fast food. All I need to do is trade my attention, maybe watch some ads, and I have unlimited access for consumption. I read that at least half of millennials don't have a moral problem with pornography. More concerned about recycling. Not only are we consuming pornography at an alarming rate, we're also producing it. Three-fourths of Gen Z students ages 15 to 18 have participated in sexting. Three-fourths. Sending an explicit photo to someone. Upon reflecting on pornography, I really like what Pope John Paul said uh, a few years ago. He said, there's no dignity when the human dimension is eliminated from the person. In short, the, porn, the problem with pornography is not that it shows too much of the person, but too little. See, pornography divorces sex from relationship, sex from the real person. 
Sexting too means I can get something from you at a distance mediated by my phone with no real commitment except I'm not going to share the photos. A contract routinely uh, violated. Alongside of pornography, C.S. Lewis mentions a similar problem with masturbation. You're like, is he really going there? It's more awkward for me, okay? <laughs> he says, the real evil, C.S. Lewis, the real evil for me of masturbation would be that it takes an appetite, which in lawful use leads the individual outside of himself, healthy sexuality, but instead sends the man back into the prison of himself. So he pretty much says, sex alone in porn or pleasing oneself, fantasy, life, lust, turns out to be a prison. Divorced from the real person. Sex as isolation. More normalized is sex outside of marriage in general. It's almost foreign to find someone waiting uh, till marriage. Or we'll hear things like, you got to test the car before you drive it. You got to move in together to test compatibility, right? Never mind the research which says that those who live together before marriage are less likely to stay married. Or the research that says that the more sexual partners we have, the less sexually satisfied we'll be. In fact, I was on Match.com this week. I wasn't looking. I'm happily married, okay? Uh, I was just doing research, I promise. I promise, babe. Just research. (laughs) And check out their relationship timeline here. Match.com relationship timeline. Timeline. Normal dating relationship. Number one, first date. Number two, the first kiss. Number three, do we want the same thing? Number four, doing the deed, sex. Number five, the what are we chat, right? The define the relationship. Six, spending more free time together. Seven, meeting the friends. Eight, saying I love you. Nine, meeting the family. Ten, uh, we're official. So, Notice that doing the deed comes like eight or nine places before saying I love you, before, uh, you know, five places or something, before meeting family, uh, before the even, like, what kind of relationship are we? I mean, seems a little early to me. Yeah. In this, sex outside of marriage almost always diminishes to the transactional level. For example, I'm committed to buy from Dutch Brothers as long as the service is good enough and the cost low enough. And in the same way, outside of marriage, I'm committed to you as long as the product's good enough and the cost low enough. But if the quality goes down or the cost goes up, I can find a better deal. I can get a new roommate. But we all know deep down that sex is a big deal, right? There are boundaries. Look at the recent, even in, even in our culture, there's boundaries. Look at the recent reactions to the cuties film on Netflix or the hashtag Me Too movement. For example, if someone touches my shoulder, it's probably not a big deal. Like if they don't ask and they touch my shoulder, you know, it might be sexual harassment if it keeps happening. But if someone touches me below the belt, that's sexual assault. Why the distinction, right? If these are just body parts touching each other, what's the big deal? But we all recognize it's not just body parts touching each other. That there's a greater significance to sexual touch. It is a big deal. Now, it's ironic. Our culture has somehow found a way to both undervalue sex and overvalue sex. To downplay it and deify it. It's no big deal, and it's the most important thing in life. Now, I mean, we could try to reconcile these things by, you know, if If we see sex as appetite, and I haven't eaten for a week, then there's going to be a sense of desperation. But it's more than that. There is a transcendence, a religious significance that we ascribe to sex in this culture. So let's look at lie number two. Sex is the most important thing in life. We might call this the overvaluing of sex. See, in the ancient world, sex, although it was routine and transactional, like we talked about Home Depot earlier, uh, it was also, it, it frequently happened in temples, holy spaces, holy places. It's a sex as religion. And we see this in the parable that the father uses to warn his son in Proverbs chapter 7. He, he tells his son a powerful story of, of, of what he observed. He says in verse 1, My words will keep you from the adulterous woman from the wayward woman with her seductive words. When I was at the window of my house, looking through the curtain, I saw some naive young men. 
and one in particular who lacked common sense. He was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman, strolling down the path by her house corner, by her house. It was at the twilight in the evening as deep darkness fell. The woman approached him, seductively dressed and sly of heart. She's often in the streets and markets, soliciting at every corner. Verse 8 and 12 use the word corner. Think of street corner. But the word has more the idea of an open-air shrine, a holy space. One Babylonian text says there was 180 of these in Babylon to the goddess Ishtar. Verse 13, she threw her arms around him and kissed him and with a brazen look said, I've just made my peace offerings and fulfilled my vows. So this could again refer to cultic prostitution, but it might be worse than that. You see, this is probably the offering that happens in Leviticus, meant to celebrate the worship of God and the worshiper in the community. And you would sacrifice your animal and you had to eat the meal that night. So not only is this woman seducing this man with her body, but with a delicious meal in the context of a religious ritual. Verse 15, you're the one I'm looking for. I came out to find you and here you are. My bed is spread with beautiful blankets, with colored sheets of Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink of our fill of love until morning. Let's enjoy each other's caresses, for my husband is not home. He's away on a long trip. He's taken a wallet full of money with him and won't return until later this month. So you got this exotic encounter that's getting built up. And I remember reading this as a student and, you know, her seduction even gripped me as a reader. I'm like, man, I know she's bad news, but she seems kind of interesting, you know? And commentator Derek Kidner points out that this character has put herself outside of the structures and laws of God and owes her disruptiveness and much of her fascination to that intriguing fact. See, one part of the appeal of sexual sin is precisely because it's wrong. Verse 22, he followed her at once like an ox going to the slaughter. He was like a stag caught in a trap, awaiting the arrow that would pierce its heart. He was like a bird flying into a snare, little knowing it would cost him his life. Her house is the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. So this sexual encounter might look like heaven on earth, but really it's hell. The the promise of sexual transcendence is really just a trap door to death. It's like a fish who sees that worm, that juicy worm, then bites into it and gets a hook in its mouth. And it's not just ancient pagan culture that glorified sex, over-promising and under-delivering. So does our modern secular culture. Scholar Ernest Becker, a cultural anthropologist and not a Christian, uh, he wrote a book called The Denial of Death, How We All as Westerners Cope with the Fact that We're Going to Die. Sounds like a lovely book, right? And he points out that when you remove a sense of God from the culture, you have to replace him with something. You have to replace him with something transcendent. And, And so Becker calls this replacement apocalyptic romance. Let us eat and drink and love for tomorrow we die. See, romance brings us some sense of significance to replace the hole that God used to occupy. We've seen this in Disney, discipling millennials like me to find true love no matter the cost. We've seen how our culture idolizes beauty and attractiveness in youth. If you're more attractive, you're more likely to get treated better, called back, hired or promoted or asked out. This impacts women a lot uh, more in, in their constant pressure to look and perform and act a certain way. We've seen this in our culture where we're encouraged to identify by our sexual desires and preferences, to embrace them. The only guardrail is consent. We might be overvaluing it when romance or sex is all we think about in our solitude. But apocalyptic romance is no real God. It's not sustainable. Proverbs uses two additional illustrations to subvert the myth that sex is most important. Illustrations of honey and a nose ring. So in Proverbs 5.3, it says, The lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as gall. Sharp as a double-edged sword. Honey is electrifying, really good on our tea and and our toast, uh, but too much of it and you'll get sick. And sex outside of the lifelong commitment of marriage is like trying to live on honey alone. It's sweet at first, 
but it's bitter later. You get a stomach ache later. Maybe it's bitter in that one person is way more emotionally invested than the other. Maybe it's bitter in that sex devolves to selfishness, just using to take and not to give. Either way, it's honey followed by hunger. Then there's the nose ring. This one's kind of funny. Proverbs eleven twenty two: like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. And oh, what an image, right? You see this beautiful gold ring. It's so gleamy and shiny. You want it. You reach out to grab it. You pull it to yourself, but you don't realize it's connected to a muddy pig. And we've all been foolish like that, fixated on the, the, the attractive, missing the pig-like character. Yeah. Women, don't be turned off by the, the male-focused language. Uh, this applies to, to both of us. Remember, this is a father addressing his son, so don't feel left out by some of these uh, images and visuals. Proverbs 31.20 says it well. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. It's probably worth mentioning two ways that the church has failed in this area too, where the church has overvalued sex. I've seen it in two ways. Um, one is the, the purity movement. Think of Josh, Josh Harris, I Kissed Dating Goodbye. Kind of a well-intentioned movement, but here's what it produced. It, it almost created a sexual prosperity gospel. Have you heard of the prosperity gospel? It teaches that if you have enough faith, God will make you healthy and wealthy. The purity movement said, at its worst, if you wait, God will bring you a perfect person. That when you get married, you'll never have any problems and live happily ever after. <laughs> and you'll never struggle with lust again because you'll be having such a great time. Marriage is painted as the finish line. But do you see what we did? We just moved the idol. Right? From sex outside of marriage to sex inside of marriage. But sex is still the idol. And when the idol lets us down, as it always will, we'll be crushed. When we realize we're married to an imperfect person, not me, but everyone else, right? <laughs> You'll be crushed. And, I mean, we read about Joshua Harris, the author of I Kiss Dating Goodbye, leaves his faith, leaves his marriage. It's tragic. The other example of this, perhaps, of a maybe overvaluing of sex is kind of a prudishness about it. Like, it's taboo. We, we don't talk about it here. I can't believe you mentioned that in church. It's too awkward, too transcendent, too holy a thing to discuss. In fact, it's similar to the tradition where Orthodox Jews would, um, they wouldn't allow men under 30 to read the Song of Solomon, the highly erotic love poetry in the Bible. And yet when something's secret, we're all the more motivated to learn more about it. Well, let's get to the good stuff, okay? In contrast to sex is no big deal or sex is the most important thing, Proverbs tells us that sex is a, an exclusive relational gift. Back to Proverbs 5. This is the text my dad and I read in that awkward car conversation. And it's quite explicit. Uh, I said this sermon was PG-13. This might be rated R. I don't know. You let me know. Proverbs 5.15. Drink water from your own cistern. Running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. I taught this passage back in February to our high school students. And, uh, you know, as I was reading verse 19 and got to the word breasts, you would not believe the whiplash of all these high school guys and they're all looking down at their phones, and all of a sudden, you know, these guys are Bible students now. They're totally invested. Hey, uh, hey, Tyler, what was that passage again? Uh, I want to take it home and study it. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing, you know. High schoolers are interested in the Bible. As we just read, Proverbs does not shrug at sex, nor does it worship it or ignore it, but it celebrates it as a profound gift. There's a reverence for sex, but not a prudishness and not a worship. Sex as a gift reminds us that it's very valuable and powerful, like when I got my 22 rifle for Christmas. But it also reminds us that the giver is more important than the gift, that God more important than romance, just like my parents were more important than that rifle. 
And of course, it doesn't take a ton of imagination to see how this gift works. I'm not going to draw you any pictures, okay? But, uh, you know, um, the, verse 15, the cistern, the well, that's an image of female sexuality. Verse 18, the fountain, an image of male sexuality. Female and male come together in joyful, marital, sexual intimacy. And their encounter is so good because it's so exclusive. Verse 15 through 17 says, drink water from your own well. In other words, uh, quench sexual desire within your marriage. Don't go outside of it. Don't share your springs with strangers. The boundaries, the confines, the commitment of marriage actually creates the best conditions for sex. It's in the security of the marriage commitment that I can truly be myself uh, without the pressure to perform without the fear of getting caught or, or without the fear of being compared to someone else or without the fear that they'll leave. See, within the confines and covenant of marriage, I can give myself entirely to that person. I quote Tim Keller a lot, but this is one of my favorite quotes of all time from him. He says, sex is God's appointed way for two people, a man and a woman, to mutually say to one another, I belong completely, permanently, and exclusively to you. On both the distorted view, sex is no big deal and sex is most important, sex is the main goal, the target, the, 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 the purpose. Whether it's appetite or worship, it's the main focus. But when sex is seen as a gift, it's no longer the main goal. The other person is the goal. I'm no longer using that person for sex, I'm using sex for that person. The sex becomes an opportunity to give and not just to get. Verse 18 in that passage in Proverbs 5 actually looks a lot like a benediction. You guys know when I end the service with a blessing, like, may the Lord bless you and give you peace, you were sent. Well, this is almost a, a blessing in and of itself, a blessing on the married couple. Imagine if I ended the service with this one for our marriages. Okay, guys, may your fountains be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Uh, church, may her breast satisfy you always, and may you ever be intoxicated with her love. You are sent. I wonder if this place would just clear out, right? People peeling out of the parking lot. I don't know. But, uh, and again, don't feel left out with the male-focused language, ladies. Remember, there's a dad talking to his son, but the idea still applies to you too. Rejoicing in your spouse, being sexually satisfied in them, uh, being intoxicated with them. Sex is a good gift from God, a gift to receive from God, a gift to give to your spouse, an, an exclusive gift for the marriage bed. You younger people, I don't say this to brag, but to inspire you, it is possible to wait until you're married. We did it and we're so thankful that we did. And there's so many things that God taught me in the waiting process as well. You see, there's something about marriage and sex and romance that points us to something greater. There's something about our love story or lack thereof, hang with me singles, there's something about our love story or lack thereof that points us to a better love story. Have you ever seen a beautiful sunset and then taken a disappointing picture? That's all of mine. Uh, it's rare for the photo to fully display what you see in person. And marriage is like that. It's a photo. It might be a little blurry. It might not have the best lighting, but it's a picture, a parable of something greater. Uh, it's a picture of God's own loyal love. You see, displayed in Jesus' death for us. So marriage and sex are meant to reflect the permanent, exclusive, and complete love of Christ for his church, for us. But just like marriage, singleness is also a picture. It's also a parable. So marriage is a picture on how God's love works, a self-sacrificial love. And singleness is a picture of how God's love is sufficient. It is more than enough for us. More than enough. And one picture isn't better than another. You might wish you were married. You might wish you were single. But the grass, uh, the grass always looks greener somewhere else, but it hardly ever is. The grass is green where you water it. Single people skip the appetizer of the, an earthly marriage, at least right now, and in the process deepen their hunger for the main meal, our marriage to Christ. What a glorious day that'll be. And married people, we might be dissatisfied with the appetizer we ordered. 
Now, the picture on the menu maybe looked better than what you got. But like one theologian said, you always marry the wrong person. You always marry the wrong person. There is no perfect person. There is no the one. So cultivate, cultivate gratitude for the spouse God has given you, if you have one. Fight for joy with them. Invest in them. And take all that dissatisfaction. We all have dissatisfaction, married or single. Take all that. Let it drive you to the God who fills every void and, and who, who meets us in that place. We're going to watch a testimony right now from a really brave young man named Joel in our church. Powerful story. And he's going to share about how he entrusted himself, how he entrusted unfulfilled sexual desires to God and, and how he rejected the narratives of this world. He rejected that sex is not that big of a deal. He rejected that sex is the most important thing in life. And he, as a single man, is entrusting himself to God right now. And he reminds us that we're all broken in this area. Who, who of us has, has not sinned sexually in this room? We all have. And we all need a Savior, amen? Christ redeems us, brings us in, and loving and knowing Christ is better than any sex or romance, anything that sex or romance can bring to us. So let's watch this testimony of Joel. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Joel, and I'm going to share about how I came to Christ. And so I'm going to start from a younger age to kind of build up how I got there. Uh, I pretty much considered myself to be gay by the time I was in middle school. I was attracted to other uh, guys by a pretty young age. and. Um, I also grew up with Christian parents and I knew what the Bible said about homosexuality and it made me really want nothing to do with God or church uh, or you know going to youth group or anything like that. I think I still believed in God but I figured I never chose to feel that way. I never chose to be gay and I thought that I was condemned for something I didn't even choose. So I figured that there's something wrong with the Bible, that that's not really God's word. By the time I'm out of high school, I was very comfortable with my sexuality. Um, and I also was just very worldly. I, I really didn't have anything to do with church. I really got into partying and uh, smoking weed all the time. And also I eventually got into psychedelic drugs, uh, which kind of pushed me into a phase of being like quote unquote spiritually enlightened and I thought that everything was God I thought that I was God you were God everything's God like a pantheistic worldview I was on a hike with my older stepbrother who is a Christian and I was sharing this worldview with him and he was sharing his worldview with me and I basically told him I didn't know if I believed in Jesus anymore as far as dying on the cross uh, for our sins and in the midst of our conversation, talking about Jesus, um, something caught the attention of my eye, and it was a rock and a tree. So I pulled this rock out of the tree, and on the rock it said, Jesus is alive. And both my brother and I were just like, whoa, you know, like that's crazy. And uh, because we were just talking about Jesus, and then I found this rock and said, Jesus is alive. He shared scripture with me that where Jesus says, let any man follow me deny himself bear his cross you know what does it for what does it profit a man to forfeit his soul and gain the world and so he was telling me I had to give my life up for Jesus and I really didn't quite know what that meant I didn't know how to do that uh, I still wanted to marry a man I actually was in a relationship with another guy who was an awesome guy he was um, funny and we had a lot of similar interests but um, even though it seemed like a, a good relationship and I could have seen myself marrying him, there was still a lot of turmoil inside and I really couldn't figure out what it was other than the fact that I was still seeking truth. I, I knew that whatever I believed, it just didn't, it didn't seem right. I was missing out on truth, so I was seeking God. Um, and I still considered myself kind of spiritually enlightened. and. I knew there was something special about Jesus though. So in the midst of researching Jesus, um, just through, yeah, through the Holy Spirit, I was being convicted that what I believed was a lie and that it was deceptive and that it was even demonic. The Holy Spirit 
uh, bear witness with me that God is who He says He is, that really um, God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And it was just this simple thing that I just needed to believe in God and believe Jesus. And so I did. And um, I knew everything was worth giving up for Jesus and that my sexuality wasn't what defined me. I was going to let God define me and I was going to live my life for God. So um, I was strongly convicted to break up with my boyfriend after surrendering to the Lord. That is uh, my most recent story of how I came to Christ, you know, and why I knew that Jesus is Lord. As Christians, we all have different temptations that we need to lead on the Holy Spirit to resist. And, you know, that could be alcohol, that could be lust, heterosexual lust, it's the same as uh, homosexual lust. And so for believers who are out there that are struggling with this, it's extremely, di extremely difficult to where this can be something that makes people walk away from God as it did for me. I encourage you, if you haven't been able to share this with fellow believers, that you should. And it can be hard to talk about this um, I just encourage you to do it because you need to have believers that are going to share your burden. Yeah, if you've got uh, any questions for me, feel free to email me or the church uh, at a confidential email that we'll put at the end here. Or even if you're not a Christian, maybe you're part of the LGBT community and um, you maybe have questions, also feel free to email or even better yet, why don't you just come to church? You're welcome, uh, you are loved and just know that people, they just love you. Uh, my name is Joel and I am not ashamed of the gospel.